Okay. And I think you're good to go. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to uh, welcome everyone to today's conversation of uh, understanding and also wish you a happy Valentine's Day. I am Dr. Sheila Carlwell, um, Vice President of Anti-Racism, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as Chief Diversity Officer for the SIU System Office. Um, I want to thank you all for participating in part four of a six-part series. Um, specifically focused on our findings from our 2022 Viewfinder Campus Climate Survey. Um, for those of you who have missed uh, the previous three parts or also would like to refresh um, on uh, those recent conversations, they can be found on our SIU uh, system YouTube channel. Um, again, today uh, we will be focused on the finding welcoming and belonging. And to do that, I am very pleased that we have joining us our expert panels who have gathered today, including Dr. Candace Hall, Dr. Angela Town, Dr. Sukyong Su, Dr. Cindy Curvo, and Mr. Nick Nimberg. Um, they will also introduce themselves uh, more fully uh, momentarily. And I'm very pleased that they represent the richest of knowledge and wisdom across our SIU campuses. I um, also would like to introduce uh, our president, uh, Dr. Dan Mahoney. Always pleased to have his insights, perspectives, and expertise as he's joining us today as well. And uh, last but not least, I would like to introduce Ms. Doris Williams. She will facilitate the question and answer portion of our conversation of understanding today. Uh, so again, if you are joining us for the first time, as a reminder, we will take the first, answer, uh, first hour to respond to prepared questions and the last 30 minutes will specifically be dedicated to all of you who have joined today as participants and attendees. We definitely want to engage you in this conversation, uh, see and listen to what questions you may have. So please feel free uh, even now to start putting questions um, in the chat. Now, so one of the things I always like to do uh, before we actually get started and do a deep dive into our questions, I wanna take a few moments to provide context for our conversation of understanding and also just familiarize, familiarize you uh, with our Viewfinder uh, Campus Climate Survey. And so just uh, entertain me for a few moments as I share my screen and actually speak to why this was a critical topic that we needed to discuss today. So again, I just wanna remind everyone, why did we actually send out a survey to 7,000 employees and 20,000 students? Our goal was to basically assess uh, perceptions to really gain an understanding of how people perceive the climate, how they perceive welcoming, how they perceive belonging, a sense of safety on the campus and in the community as well. We also wanted to evaluate resources to make sure that they are adequate for our different populations that we serve, racial, ethnic minorities, this piece of people with disabilities, um, as well as our LGBTQIA, uh, people in addition to our international population. So those are all of the groups that we evaluated. And we also wanted to, again, analyze uh, those particular experiences. I think it's worthwhile to share who exactly responded uh, to this particular survey. So when we look at our students, we had about a 18% response rate. Um, employees, about 52% of our employees across all of our campuses responded to the survey. 47% uh, identified as uh, male and 52% um, as, I'm sorry, excuse me, 47% um, as male, 2% as uh, non-conforming, and then 49% uh, uh, for women um, identified as far as demographics. When we specifically look at racial ethnic demographics, this is also a very telling piece to see who exactly responded to this survey. So 77% of our respondents identified as white, 7% as African-American, 10% as Asian, 3% as Hispanic, Latino, and then 3% as multiracial. So again, I want us to keep those demographics in mind as we look at the data. And then also um, another important finding is that we did ask uh, specifically for our LGBTQIA plus respondents as far as how they identify. So 22% of our students identified as LGBTQIA plus, about 8% of our faculty, along with 8% of our staff members also identified as LGBTQIA+. And when we look at the perceptions, again, we wanna ask the question, do you feel welcome? Do you feel belonging? And I think, again, it's worth uh, repeating that individuals who feel welcome on a campus feel like they're invited, 
that they feel welcome, that there is a sense of respect. But when you think about a belonging, you have ownership of the campus. Um, you feel like you are equal to your counterparts on the campus. And it's important to make that distinction. So when we specifically ask team members from the LGBTQIA community about their perceptions of welcome and belonging, we found that underrepresented students who identify as LGBTQIA have the lowest rate of belongingness among all respondents. And we're gonna actually address this during our conversation. We looked at our Likert scale, and as you can look at those particular numbers, a weighted average um, Hispanic Latino had the lowest at 3.24 compared to 3.30 for African-Americans, 3.40 for Asian, Asian-Americans, and at the highest 3.64 for white um, students who attend our SIU campuses. Um, also, it's worth noting that more than half of our LGBTQIA administrators, faculty, and staff and students affirm that they can express their identity on campus, but less so in the surrounding community. And so we know we have work to do to make sure that not only do people feel welcome on campus, but they also feel welcome um, in the surrounding community because that's also a part of their home um, life and environment as well. We go to um, our different constituents, our faculty and uh, staff as far as feeling welcome. If we look at the uh, blue bar, uh, that represents um, uh, welcoming as far as faculty, 65% of white um, faculty members feel welcome, 30% of um, African-Americans and 53% of Hispanic um, felt welcome on the campus. When we look at Asian, um, it was actually very consistent with faculty, staff, as well as students. So those with those bars represent 64% of uh, faculty and it was, it was actually even across the board. It is worth noting when we specifically look at our African-American uh, faculty, and that's what this blue bar represents, 31% felt welcome compared to 51% of staff members compared to 70% of students. So students had the highest sense of belonging in that particular category, and faculty members had the lowest sense of belonging. Uh, specifically, we look at Hispanic and Latino. And then um, if we look at the uh, white, as far as um, faculty members, 80% felt welcome. Um, Students, um, actually, I would say faculty, I'm sorry, staff, 63%, and students, again, were very high at 78%. So we get to see, uh, again, across the board, what are the perceptions of welcome when we look at faculty, staff, as well as students. And these were some um, also uh, narrative findings. Over 50% of all faculty, staff, students, and administrators felt welcome on our campuses, but who was at the actually highest uh, ranking administrators? and white employees felt most welcome among our groups. And so one of the things we wanna take note of looking at this particular demographic is what are some of the power dynamics that administrators as well as white employees felt most welcome among all groups on our campuses. Over 60% of veterans, LGBTQIA, international and people with disabilities felt welcome on our campuses. But we actually did, again, look and see that underrepresented LGBTQIA uh, community uh, members did not feel as welcome. And we also found looking at our findings that international students felt welcome and respected on campus, but again, did not feel as welcome when they went external to the SIU campuses within the community. White and Asian staff members felt more welcome than Hispanic and Latino staff members. And again, we will address those findings as well today. Uh, another question that is also uh, worth uh, distinguishing is that not only did we ask uh, faculty members and staff members and administrators that they feel welcome, we also asked if they felt equal. And so that we found that staff members from racialized ethnic groups reported lower levels of respect and unequal treatment to their white counterparts. So again, it's one thing to say we feel welcome, but do you feel belonging? Do you feel like you have ownership? Do you feel like there's equality? And we found that those numbers uh, were much lower, uh, under 50%, even though the, the numbers show 65% or higher when it comes to welcoming, they were under 50% when we asked about equal treatment. Um, another um, concerning data point when we think about welcoming is Hispanic faculty members were seven times more likely than white or Asian, than their white or Asian counterparts um, to say that they experienced racism, strongly experienced, um, agree that they experienced racism. And we want to actually um, entertain and engage our team members today to find out some of the uh, reasons for that. Uh, white and African Americans perceive themselves to be less welcome than other ethnic groups on campus. And so I want to actually repeat that again, because we actually just saw data showing that 80% um, of white individuals uh, felt welcome. So why is it that white and African-Americans perceive themselves to be less welcome than other groups on campus? So I wanna take a moment to talk about this. We asked, we did correlation and comparison data. 
uh, with this uh, particular campus climate survey. And we asked the question, if you was to not only look at your group and compare yourself to other groups, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I'm African-American, but not only am I asked to rate myself sense of welcome, I'm also asked to look at how do uh, whites um, feel welcome on campus? How do Latino, Hispanic community members feel welcome on campus? How do Asian? So as an African-American, that group said, we feel, although we are welcome on campus, every other group, Asian, Hispanic, and faculty members are, are um, Asian American, Hispanic, as well as whites, that they're more welcome than us. When we ask the white uh, team members the exact same question, do you feel welcome? 80% said yes. But interestingly enough, they actually said that other groups on campus are more welcome than they are. So whites, even though they, uh, white uh, community members said they felt welcome, they rated African Americans, Asian, and Hispanic members more welcoming than them. And so I think that is a perception that we might want to also identify. Uh, a few more data points before we dive into questions. African American Black students were twice as likely to want to leave the campus compared to uh, white students. Uh, one of the things that we focus on as an anti racism campus is that we definitely want to make sure that everyone has a sense of belonging, uh, but we also are very uh, focused on retaining our students, um, after we recruit them, we wanna make sure that they have a sense of belonging that they can thrive on campus. So we're very concerned that these students were twice as likely to wanna leave the campus compared to their white counterparts, okay? And so with that, uh, I just wanted to provide those data points and now I would like to stop sharing and turn it over to President Dan Mahoney to actually just um, emphasize why this conversation is, is crucial for today. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Caldwell. And a couple things I'll say, first of all, yeah, the topic today focusing on that uh, feeling of being welcome and really more importantly, a sense of belonging is important to us uh, in so many different ways, both as you talked about in recruiting, but also retaining people, both students, faculty, staff, all of those groups. Um, so it's important to look at this as a topic. Um, as I often say, I, I've played both in the qualitative and quantitative world as a researcher, and I think both are critically important. And what we really have tried to do with the Campus Climate Survey is that was our quantitative approach. So we did those surveys got the information we, we received, and this shows us that we have some issues relative to sense of belonging across various groups on our campuses. So for me, the next step is to take more of a qualitative approach. Let's talk about why are those, why is that the case, and frankly, what we can do differently. Um, so this is our qualitative step, and, and just one part of our qualitative step. And I want to thank our panelists for participating, because each of them will bring expertise, not only based on their experiences, but they have interactions with a lot of people across our system and on their campuses that have probably shared with them their experiences and why they may not have that feeling of welcome and, and belonging that we want them to have. So again, thank you everybody for being here today and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, President Mahoney. And I appreciate the emphasis that our goal today is to be solution oriented and we really wanna unpack some of these issues. And so I'm gonna start uh, the question with uh, Dr. Candace Hall. If you could first introduce yourself uh, more to our attendees today. And if you can also share, as we looked at that startling data point, uh, what experiences are African-American students having that make them feel less welcome than white and Hispanic students? And why are they twice as likely, do you believe, based on your insights to want to leave the campus? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Candace Hall. I use she, her pronouns. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership um, here at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. I'm also the program director for the Higher Education and Student Affairs program and vice president for the Black Faculty and Staff Association. Um, excited to be here and, and share with you all today. Um, one of the things that I did as um, also the chair of the campus engagement committee um, with BFSA was conduct a survey among black students to see what their needs were and to see how we could connect to them. One of the things we found out in their survey was that um, black students don't know where black faculty are. We don't see them often. There's not a lot of black faculty and that um, is a struggle for them being able to connect with faculty that look like them in the classroom. So one, I think one of the problems is representation in the classroom, which, which speaks to faculty recruitment, which is also tied to the strategic plan, right? And one of our goals um, and where my work lies in. So my research is around recruiting um, 
faculty of color, what it takes to retain them and to support them while they're in their, those roles. But one of the things I think is, is representation um, and thinking about the experiences that not only black faculty have, but also black staff members have on campus. So when black staff and faculty are having particularly difficult experiences um, on, on their campuses, that trickles down into the student experience, right? Whether we want that to happen or not, um, it's something that, that happens. Likewise, if they're having very positive experiences, that's gonna impact how students are experiencing the space. So one of the things I think um, is being attentive to not only the student experience, but also the staff and the faculty experience, um, because recognizing how much um, that those things are intertwined and it will help black students to feel more welcome on campus. Thank you uh, for that excellent insight, Dr. Hall. And I actually just wanna reinforce your point. When we actually look at faculty, staff and students across the different ethnic groups, we saw that those bars were actually quite similar. Um, mm -hmm. I would say with the exception of Hispanic, it was pretty consistent. And in fact, Asian was 64% across the board, which was remarkable as far as faculty, staff and students. And so again, like you said, you can't, pour into students what you don't get, right, uh, from the yes. campus community. And so it is important that um, that holistic experience and that all members are being treated well because it's gonna impact. We, we're in community together and it's gonna have that impact. So again, that was excellent insight. Thank you for that. Uh, and now I would like to go to um, uh, Dr. Angela Town. If you could actually uh, specifically share what strategies should be employed to increase belongingness for LGBTQIA plus students on campus and the surrounding communities. We just heard the data point again that those underrepresented students uh, feel the most marginalized on campus. So any insights you can share uh, with that. And then I'm also going to turn it over to Mr. Nick uh, Nimberg to share as well. Sure. So there's a lot of strategies. And let me introduce myself first. I'm Dr. Angela Town. I use she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs pronouns. And I'm the LGBTQ Resource Center Coordinator uh, here at SIUC. Um, so a couple of things um, uh, in terms of strategies uh, to increase um, belongingness of LGBTQIA plus students. Um, the first thing I think is important to consider is using an intersectional lens when we talk about representation and programming and policy making. And so an intersectional lens is a lens that considers how um, marginalized identities overlap um, or intersect to create unique experiences. So how a student's social location exposes them to different forms of marginal, marginal excuse me, marginalization on campus. Um, and so in using an inter intersectional lens, we acknowledge that gender diversity and same sex or gender love and attraction can occur across categories of race and ethnicity, um, religion, citizenship status, ability, age, et cetera. Um, so having that lens in mind at the forefront is really important str uh, strategically. Uh, another point I want to make that's so important is honoring a person's name uh, and pronouns is incredibly impactful. And we don't, it's the research, it, it, it just stuns me really how impactful it is. So for example, I was looking at a 2018 study uh, done in the Journal of Adolescent Health, and it just looked at chosen name use across contexts, so not even pronoun use, just chosen name use. And they adjusted for personal characteristics and social support. And I will read you the, the findings is when there was one incre an increase in one context of where in that context, a person's chosen name was used that uh, resulted in a 5.37 unit uh, decrease in depressive symptoms on the Beck uh, depression inventory, a 29% decrease in suicidal ideation and a 56% decrease uh, in suicidal behavior. So we're talking about one context and that context could be a classroom. It could be um, a meeting, you know, with your financial aid person. Um, just know increasing that one context and you're that person that's doing that or your team is doing that, um, pr correct pronoun use, correct uh, name use, that's impactful in these, in, these, um, in these really important ways. And the last point I wanna make, there's a lot of strategies, but the last point I wanna make is that queer people look for cues that we are welcome in a space. 
Um, it could be a brochure. Um, it could be a safe zone training plaque. You know, it could be a sticker. Um, it could be uh, inclusion in, in curriculum, um, inclusion in assignments, um, all kinds of ways to uh, increase representation and increase those cues um, that were welcome um, as a we, we look for those cues and when we see them, um, those are important messages uh, to me and to my community. And then I'll, I'll let um, Nick take over with some other ideas. Thanks, Angela. Um, I'm uh, Nick Niemerg. I serve as the Assistant Director of Constituent Relations for the SIU Edwardsville Foundation. And um, apart from that, I also have served as the uh, past uh, staff co-chair for SIUE Safe Zone, and then I'm the current president of the SIUE Queer Faculty and Staff Association. Um, Angela brought up a really good point about um, recognizing people's pronouns and names. That whole concept is something that we really stress during our um, uh, safe zone training, something called inclusive language. And I, I am so glad that Angela brought up those stats because that's, that's so imperative. And I think one strategy that could help um, not only with um, uh, queer student belonging, but also um, queer faculty and staff belonging. It's a very time intensive process, but it's so worth it. Taking a look at current at current policies that are in place on camp on our campuses, and just making sure that gender inclusive language is included, and really inclusive language in uh, general, um, and then taking it a step further, um, uh, in particular from the uh, student lens. Um, is also doing some sort of a process mapping exercise where you're putting yourself in the shoes of a student who um, maybe wants to uh, get their name and uh, gender changed on official um, student documents. Going through that process and seeing what 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 um, administrative uh, roadblocks are in place, what what systems aren't um, talking to each other, um, and then through that through that exercise. Um, being able to remove some of those um, unnecessary barriers just to make it as seamless as possible um, for uh, students to um, be able to identify how they wish on uh, campus. And then um, back to the um, policy audit, um, also taking into account um, hiring practices and, and, and what we're and, and um, what we're communicating to to potential new hires who might identify as LGBTQIA+, in particular um, our uh, trans and uh, non-binary folks. So um, apart from the uh, policy audit, um, I'm really excited that Carbondale has an LGBT um, uh, resource center. I think something like that could be a, could be a huge resource to all of the campuses, um, and then also making sure that it is um, professionally staffed so that so that these programs and initiatives can have a sense of um, longevity and um, and making sure that they're consistent. Um, but yeah, there's tons and tons of of, of, of um, opportunities and um, uh, strategies, but um, those are just a few that I can think of. Thank you so much, uh, Angela and Nick. Uh, that was very uh, valuable data uh, that you just shared with us. And again, um, as we talk about belonging, just the importance of making people feel seen and respected and identified uh, based on, again, how they choose to be identified. And just to know that that one example could decrease depression by 56%. That's very powerful. And I would like to say that's so little to ask of anybody in our community. <laughs> it's just so little to ask and it has such a powerful impact. And so I, again, I wanna thank you for that. And also Nick, when you talked about um, seamlessness, I wanted to actually speak to that because again, as we talk about a sense of belonging, we're thoughtful, we're intentional. We wanna make things easy for people. We don't want them to have to have a difficult time navigating our environment and our system. So I think again, what can we do? You talked about the safe zone training. I just, I think Dr. Town, if you could just brag a little bit, how many trainings have you done on the Carbondale campus this past year? Oh, wow. How many trainings? Oh, I know in October I had, um, I had met, uh, I had surpassed rather 300 folks trained and I haven't done a count uh, lately, but I really should. Oh yeah. Well, I think I understand it. it was impressive. I heard you <laughs> mention it before and it was impressive. So I just, again, wanted to mention that as a, a resource because it's really um, a way for us to all become educated on how we could dignify um, our LGBTQIA uh, Q 
community members on campus. And the last thing I wanted to mention before we uh, move on to uh, Dr. Cuervo is that we do have an inclusive language guide and I wanna make sure everybody is aware of that. Uh, Dr. Town and others have had an opportunity to speak into that. But that whole guide is dedicated to respectful and inclusive language as far as how we want to communicate um, and how we want to see each other and dignify each other on campus. And so that is uh, a system-wide creation. And I would highly encourage you to look at that guide. And it's on the SIU system uh, webpage as well as on our uh, individual campuses' websites as well. So thank you again for that, that insight. Uh, uh, Dr. Cuervo, if I could now um, have you share uh, from your unique perspective about members of the Hispanic and Latino community feeling um, less belonging on our SIU campuses. We saw that their numbers were the lowest at 31%. Um, and based on your leadership and personal and lived experiences, if you could give us insights on, on why you believe that's the case. Hi, everyone. And nice to meet you all. Um, uh, first, I want to introduce myself. I'm a Associate Professor of Pedagogy and Spanish in the College of Arts and Sciences at SIUE. And I am also the director of the K through 12 teacher certification program. And um, yes, uh, what the data show is that uh, Hispanics do feel that they do not belong. And uh, it's clearly, you know, the main, I think, cause is the percentage of Hispanics at the university. Um, as you saw on the survey, only 3% were the respondents for Hispanics. These numbers do not, are not proportionally represented compared to the US populations where Hispanics are the largest minority. And even in Illinois, probably we are the largest minority if we count everybody that is not being counted. Um, so um, that, that needs to change. But we talk about you know, recruitment and retention now since we don't feel like we belong, ret the retention part becomes an issue. So even when Hispanic faculty arrive to the, the university, we there are very few of us with PhDs. There are very few of us that are from here. So we come from places far away. And, um, you know, it takes, you know, uh, we have to be willing to move to a small community, you know, remote from our families. And um, it, it, it is not easy. And then when you get here, you don't feel like you belong to this community because you don't look the same, you don't speak um, the same. So it, it is make it harder. Now at the university, we tend to blend in because we look a lot like, you know, why people said, you know, they look more like us. They probably feel like us as well. And this is an assumption that is uh, erroneous, right? Um, so there are many things that uh, can be done to, you know, increase to improve this sense of belongingness uh, among Hispanic faculty. Um, opportunities for us to network, research, communicate. We don't even have an organization for Hispanic faculty at SIUE. Um, so there are no opportunities for that to collaborate in research to be focused on Hispanic issues. Uh, we don't have a, a, a space to share our experiences or to get to know each other. So I think a, a main issue is isolation, isolation and lack of support from you know, the university because it's like we don't exist in, on campus. Even though we're here spread out a few numbers, but we are here. Um, we are not present in any leadership positions. There's no administrators and very few chairs. Well, some of us don't want to be chair because it's not fairly compensated. It's not worth, you know, what it takes. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the administration jobs, you know, there are not, I don't think any, maybe a few Hispanics. Uh, that's all that's here support for faculty engaging in Latino issues. Um, there is no support or encouragement for that. Uh, for us, it just counts as service and we already do a lot of service. So just for me being engaged in creating this group, it, it's a great commitment that is not um, valued at the university. 
uh, repre representation at the university at all in the curriculum, offering courses that are, you know, dedicated to Hispanics, uh, represented in the media, in pictures, in events in, in the community. Um, so, so being able to see ourselves, not only is gonna help us feel like we belong, but also will help us keep students at the university because they'll see that there are people like them on campus. Uh, so presence in general, uh, value efforts on community uh, building, you know, the university participating in events that are, you know, in our community that are Hispanic related. That's very important that SOU also has presence in those events so we attract uh, students and faculty uh, to the university because we are engaged. Um, and, you know, this is a great start. Having this survey is, you know, making us have a voice, having this time here to talk about the issues, to be heard, and to listen to everybody. This is important. And I think that's one of the major things, you know, communication and numbers. Yes. Oh, thank you for um, sharing that. That was also very valuable. And I think even the way you started was a, a very uh, impactful thing that we need to think about is when you speak about Illinois, the growth is coming specifically from the Hispanic and Asian uh, community. So what does it look like that we're 3%? And I think it's like close to 20% easily in Illinois, I would say close to the 18%. And so we, we've heard things about what does it look like to be underrepresented in the student body in the faculty, in the staff, and what type of impact does that have across the board? And so I know that that's a conversation that we've had, and that's something that we actually definitely want to change because, again, if you have 18% in the state and 3% on campus, then that's definitely something that uh, we need to change, or 3% who even responded to the, to the survey. Um, and again, I also just want to emphasize, um, you talked about invisible labor, and oftentimes people from underrepresented groups they're doing the work, it's meaningful, it's retaining the students that we do have, but it is not valued, it's not compensated. And so one of the things that we're also looking at is the tenure and promotion process and one make, to make recommendations about how uh, those acts of service that really strengthen our campuses uh, need to be compensated and made more uh, visible. And people like you who, who are doing the work is getting proper credit and, and compensation for those activities. So uh, again, thank you for that. But I did want to just say those themes, uh, we've heard it from Dr. Hall, we've heard it from uh, Angela, uh, Dr. You know, uh, Denberg, uh, Dr. Town as well. So we just want to make sure that we're seeing these common threads as well as patterns. Um, across the board. And we talked about, again, the growth in um, the Asian um, community as well. And so, uh, Dr. Suk Young, I would like to transition uh, to you. And if you could just talk about the experiences that Asian American students are having that make them feel uh, less welcome than their white and Hispanic students. Again, I just want to share the data point that uh, I think the white welcoming was 78%, Latinx was 70% specifically for students, different from um, staff, right? Uh, but then Asian Americans was actually at 64 percent, so about 14 uh, percent less than their white counterparts. So what do you think about uh, that and what can we do to strengthen uh, welcome and sense of belonging for Asian American um, students um, on our campus? Sure. Um, let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Su Gyeong Sa. I am a, an <clears throat> assistant professor in medical education and director of organizational change. Uh, for the School of Medicine, as well as um, equity strategy, equity transformation strategies for the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office here. So I deal with a lot of uh, organizational change and then how to make these ideas into more of a sustainable change for the school. Um, so Another role that I started a few months ago is a advisor for Asian Pacific American Students Association for medical school. So about 20% of medical school students are Asian or Asian heritage. Um, so one of the things that came out from this conversation with the students is that there's a lack of camaraderie between Asian students. And then that's interesting because it, they think that compared to LGBTQ community or Latinx community, um, they tend to be really 
big on reaching out once they start the school and then the more senior students would reach out and then just for connection point and to chat and then see how things are going among Asian students for some reason it's not really there and then I think Asian is such a like overarching term so for example China and Korea we are like really close geographically but we have very strong identity even like Taiwanese they don't want like to be called as Chinese for example so I think um, just because we have a similar skin tone that doesn't we doesn't necessarily as we are the same group um, also like Indian they think they are Asian but then like very different from East Asian and Southwest Asian. So it's um, just, that's one of the reasons that why it's not necessarily easily naturally form the commonality. And then the way we identify Asian can be a little bit different about that. Um, another interesting point that I learned is that we are the majority in the minority groups. So there is some sort of internal guilt of forming this group and then asking for attention and then asking for help. So we always think that what the other groups need more, the other groups um, have much worse experiences. So it feels like, well, are we entitled for asking for attention and then talking about our needs? So, you know, our culture tends to be do your work really well, work hard, and then don't make noise and then don't bring un, uh, unwanted attention. So that's oftentimes most of Asian culture um, and that we are so used to. So I think it really giving them or giving us a permission that it is okay, we have our needs. And then 64% welcoming is not okay. We just seem to have like just A-okay across the board from faculty to students. And then we want to feel more belong. And um, I think it starts with just the connection point. And then I think it can be encouraged through some sort of affinity group. I mean, this we are the newest group. It's, it, we started less than a year ago. Um, so just past summer. And then it's been very active. And then ever since it was formed about active 50 students, not only just the Asian students, and then a lot of the people, allies. So we have over 50 students. And then they are not from Asia. I mean, they're from Bloomington and Decatur. And then like about an hour, hour and a half drive from this campus. So I think acknowledging that yet there is a cultural needs that we like to celebrate together. And then there is a connection through some sort of a cultural differences that we acknowledge and then appreciate uh, that can be really helpful as well. Um, yeah, anything else from, I just wanted to be a good representative for my group. Um, yeah, so. They, the last point is they also want to get some of our connections. Just because academically they're doing well, um, that's also a stereotype. They may not be doing well either. And then there's the perception is, oh, you are Indian, you are Korean, you must be doing okay. Uh, even if they're academically doing okay, that doesn't mean that they um, are okay overall. Um, so checking in and then see how you're doing is very important. So a couple of weeks ago, when there was a shooting in California over um, Lunar New Year, a couple of my friends and colleagues from EDI office texted me and then called me and see if I was okay. And then I actually didn't know about the news that day. And then just that in itself felt like I belong here. So that gesture, that just text or how are you doing? I feel so bad about this. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort, but it means so much. So I just wanted to emphasize that um, we sometimes feel like minority in the EDI space, but the majority in the <laughs> minority space, it's kind of a weird balance. Um, but then the connection needs is across the board. It's universal and they need to be appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Sue. That was uh, very well 
um, articulated as far as us really being able to unpack some of the nuances of that. I mean, you kind of did use the term model minority myth, but some of the challenges that, that comes along with people having this perception that you are the favored uh, minoritized group of all uh, the minorities and just the concept of work hard, play nice, you know, <laughs> I've heard it uh, put that way, um, you know, before. But like you said, I, I think it's also worth noting uh, when you pointed out that I think oftentimes, you know, in, in this country particularly, it's like, you know, we really kind of reduce people to a color <laughs> in some ways, like you're black, you're yellow, you're mm -hmm. red, or you're of this group. And so what does it look like when you talk about the Asian community who is actually, um, I, I kind of heard the resistance to assimilation and who's still owning um, as much as they can their ethnic identity. We identify as Korean or we identify as Taiwanese or we identify as, you know, Japanese or Chinese. And again, um, maybe that that resistance to, you know, meld into that one group because we are ethnic, right? <laughs> We're not just one, one thing. And so I think that is worth noting and how that could be challenging to get that camaraderie because people are still holding on to their culture and their unique identity. So I appreciate you unpacking uh, that for us. And I think that's also, I see the challenge in that, but I also think that's something beautiful and something to be celebrated. And I think it's also something that other people might aspire to, to really kind of hold on uh, to their unique uh, characteristics um, as, as much as possible based on knowledge. Um, so again, um, that that was helpful. And I, and I just wanted to uh, thank you for that. And I also wanted to actually maybe start out asking you, uh, we're going to kind of go in reverse order. If you could just maybe talk about personally, you kind of, you were an excellent steward <laughs> and representative of your group. But if you could talk about personally, uh, what makes you feel a sense of belonging and welcome on campus? You even talked about just that call when something, you know, catastrophic happened in a community and someone checking on you. What are some other things that make you feel welcome and sense of belonging um, on the SIU campus? So going from me? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so greeting in their own language was very powerful for me. So I was fortunate that in my department, there was uh, one at the time Korean professor. So just greeted with my language was a big thing. And then... Um, also, having the community now that PAMSA is a mouthful affinity group, the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association. Um, but just having seen that group thriving, and then they have so many cool ideas. Um, so just seeing them growing and thriving in that space is so nice to see. So I think it, it's nice to do so individual gesture of connection and checking in, but also school-wide, we need to create some of the safe space and then space that's encouraged to connect. So I think we need to nudge a little bit more. And then as a system-wide, um, <clears throat> trying to be mindful when we create any of the EDIs or anti-racism space, whether any race is kind of uh, missed out or not paying as much attention because it, it's um, about 10% of our student population is Asian. And then um, in some ways we feel kind of neglected. So it'd be great if a system wise uh, make some intentional effort of scanning our policies. So I, another thing I heard, you talked about the affinity groups and the connections. I heard Dr. Purvo say that as well. Um, can you tell us uh, how to greet you uh, <laughs> in your uh, native tongue? Like, uh, you can demonstrate that. So. Yeah, sure. Annyeong haseyo. It is a how are you in Korean. Yeah. So, I'm going to ask you that again. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that. And we'll, I'm going to yeah, repeat that. Sure. Right. Yeah. Thank you for demonstrating that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great thing. And now, uh, Dr. Cuervo, again, I said I'm going to reverse uh, order. If you could just share, um, even personally, what are some things that make you feel a sense of belonging at, as well as welcoming on campus, ownership as well as invitation? Yeah, I had to think about that. Um, and, you know, I also discussed sort of with a few Hispanic colleagues that I have. Um, and, you know, um, I think um, the most sense of belongingness has been when we go to a conference. 
and we see people like us, you know? So really it doesn't happen at the university. It happens when we're outside of a university and we represent our university there. Uh, so that's when, you know, the, the, the point where we feel that we belong outside of the university. That's what I would say. Uh, so or more opportunities since we don't have the community on campus to, you know, maybe go to conference related to our affinity group, to our, to our ethnicity will be important. Maybe a group of us can go and connect and get to learn more about what we can do to improve, you know, how we feel on campus. I think it would be really great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Makes sense. No, it does. It does make sense. And I think you, you kind of kept with that theme. It's like, what is it when we're scattered, we're weakened? And when we're gathered together, uh, we're, we're strong and, there, and there's identity uh, and, and connection. And so, again, as even as we talk about that 3%, like really thinking about what opportunities we have to gather and strengthen um, on the Edwardsville campus. And I do believe those opportunities exist and there's a lot of opportunity for growth as well. So thank you for sharing the importance of that. And again, um, if it's not strong internally, what are those external resources that we can connect to, again, to strengthen um, our Hispanic and Latino um, faculty and staff members on campus as well as our students. That, that's an important strategy. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. And now I'm gonna to go to uh, Mr. Nick Nimmer, if you could share what makes you feel a sense of welcome and belonging. Yeah, um, to kind of echo what you said, I, I feel really fortunate to be at a university that recognizes and um, helps support a uh, faculty and staff association where I feel like I'm not the only one on campus. I mean, I've I've been here for five years, and I and I I remember like when I first started, I was it, it felt like I was the only queer person here. I know that's not anywhere near true, but being able to have an organized group where we can meet, we can we can discuss issues, work together to help make the university better for everyone. I think I'm I'm really encouraged by um by um what this group can accomplish um this is our this is our first full academic year of being an official group so we're still um uh laying the uh, building blocks for how this group's going to function and and um and uh what kind of things we do but um i'm, I'm really encouraged by being able to be a part of something like that um and then having having some intentional um, staff support um, through our friends at the hub on, on uh, um, SIUE's campus is also very crucial and uh, very critical. Um, we're, we've been able to work together to collaborate and partner to make, to, to help, to help everyone succeed. So um, any, any sort of opportunity to work together, collaborate, um, is it speaks uh, bounds to to um, the uh, potential that we can um, accomplish. Excellent, thank you, and I I do appreciate that. And just as a reminder, all of our campuses do have uh, the roles. And when you talk about the hub, Dr. Jessica Harris, as well as Ms. Libby Wagner, I think about the SIU Carbondale campus. We have Dr. Frazier again um, on the School of Medicine, Dr. Sukyung Su, as well as Dr. Wendy Elamy, who is uh, leading that initiative. So. Uh, there are individuals who um, are very receptive to these ideas. And even as, um, you know, Nick just spoke about who are actually facilitating and cultivating these groups to create more affinity, more belonging, uh, stronger connections. Um, again, so we can um, thrive because we are all at our campuses for a common goal. and We want to be able to show up to work every day and feel like we belong and also feel like we could be very effective at doing the work that we've been entrusted to do on our respective campuses. So. Again, um, those connections across, even outside of our affinity groups are also important as well. So I appreciate you mentioning that. And now I'm gonna to go to um, Dr. Uh, Town and then, yeah, Dr. Town, if you could share about uh, what we can do to strengthen belonging for you and, and, as well as others, what makes you feel welcome and what we can do to also help others feel welcome also. Can't yeah, you. sure. I, I resonated with what everyone has said so far and uh, something that, um, is an experience for me that's unique to my position is the amount of LGBTQIA plus 
and ally, um, full-time faculty and staff that reached out and um, have done volunteer work, repeated volunteer work in programming um, out of the resource center. So I've been here just over a year and 20, uh, we had 20 full-time faculty and staff do repeat volunteer work. And so we had, I was able to do all of this programming and it was, it was so welcoming. And also I want to add um, departmental financial support. Um, when departments um, uh, express allyship financially, um, uh, it, it's, it's a strong message. So that's part of it too. I agree. We, we do need financial resources. <laughs> uh, so that, that is a, another way to demonstrate um, uh, support as well. So thank you for sharing that. And, and last but not least, Dr. Uh, Candace Hall, if you could share again about sense of belonging and welcome for you as well as what we could do to strengthen that for others on our SIU campuses. Yeah, so I feel like I'm a bit of an anomaly. Um, I have a great sense of belonging on this campus because of colleagues that I'm blessed to um, work with in my department. So prior to me starting here, um, my colleague and now my dear friend, Dr. JT Snipes, he reached out to me um, and, and took but took the initiative to help me to get acclimated to campus, introducing me to people, asking me about my hopes and dreams for my future year. Um, and that meant a lot to me, right? That he cared enough to think about how I would experience the institution before I even got here. So I think about how powerful that is to be able to work with um, people that care, right? And it's hard to teach people how to care, but I'm thankful that I had that experience. Even my department chair, um, reached out to me and did the same thing. And at the time when I started here, um, my my sons were actually going through uh, preparing for medical procedures. And so I had to figure out um, switching insurance paperwork and this and that. And I was just, you know, frazzled and um, didn't know where to go. This is a new campus. I don't know the policies. I don't know who to talk to. But my department chair took time and walked me through the process and um, put me in touch with the people I needed to talk to to help make that transition not so scary. Um, and so it's, I find um, Michelle Obama talks in her book about the power of small, right? So it's not that this big overwhelming thing that happened that made me feel like I belong here, but it was the small interactions that I had with my colleagues in my department that really helped me think about the institution in a different way and made me want to be committed to being here, um, which made me want to do the same with the colleagues that came in after me, right? So recently I produced a documentary about my experience here at SIUE, about the cluster hire that our dean, um, Dean Robin Hughes, dean of the School of Education and Health and Human Behavior, um, initiated when she when she started here. And we've been able to build community because of that cluster hire. And it's something that I'm grateful to experience, but I also want Heidi to be able to experience that, right? Like imagine what the survey results might be for our Hispanic students if they're seeing more faculty that look like them. And not only more faculty that look like them, but faculty that were actually having really great experiences here, able to have community to support each other, to love each other, and to help each other thrive. Like then the students have a very different experience, right? Because then they have this, this sense of home, this sense of place um, at their institution, which is what our students have with us, right? A, a lot of our black students are like, I've never had a black faculty member. Or I've never been taught by this many black faculty ever in my life. For me, I didn't have any black faculty in my whole experience. So to be able to give my students something that I didn't have, um, it's something that's really powerful. So I hope um, I hope to be able to scale this work up and to help my colleagues across campuses um, to, to think about how we can get to this place where, where everybody belongs, right? Because it's not, it's not enough that like, oh, I feel great, I have community, I'm gonna go about my business. Like, that's not the work. The work is now is like, how do we scale this? How do we attend to, um, the colleagues that I know are not having the same experience that I'm having so that we can begin to shift this campus climate 
Um, and not only students have a sense of belonging, but also faculty have a sense of belonging. I think that is really important. Wow, uh, Dr. Hall, that was that was a very powerful way to actually end this conversation because what you did was just offer a counter narrative. I mean, what does it look like again to have that support from day one to have that role modeling? And now we don't even necessarily have to look outside of the SIU. We have an example uh, with the School of Education. And, and, and what you've been able to accomplish when we talk about thriving and belonging, we use that word a lot, but now you are an award-winning, you have this award-winning documentary uh, that you've done and now it's available to the campus and it's been presented on all these different campuses, you know, across uh, the United States because people really see the power and what does it look like to, to gather um, and to strengthen and for you to have those positive experiences. And like you said, and now students. Um, are reaping the benefits of that experience. And so you do have that sense of welcome and that sense of belonging. And so we don't want you to be an outlier, <laughs> right? We want uh, to join you and we want that to, like you said, scale um, across uh, the campus. And again, we have a powerful example as far as exactly how that can look. So the cluster hiring, but even when you talked about the power of small, and I just wanted to uh, emphasize that because when we talk about sense of belonging and welcome, that's everybody. It's not the administrators, it's not just faculty, staff, students, it takes everybody on, you know, campus. Um, and, you know, we have faculty, we, we have our president here. And so we recognize that it doesn't matter what someone's role is for us to all feel that way. A lot of times it's in proximity. How do we treat people who are in our space? We have dominion over our space. How are we welcoming them? How are we respecting them? How are we using pronouns? How are we making people uh, feel seen by honoring them when they come into our space every day. That's really what's going to help us have a strong sense of welcome and belonging. And we individually and collectively uh, have the power to control that. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I see some great questions. I would like to keep them coming. We're going to end uh, this conversation before we transition the questions with one more uh, question for our panel members. And we've actually talked about what we desire, what um, can make us uh, feel of a sense of belonging. But I also want us to talk about um, what can be lost. And, and I don't think this is uh, nothing that we want to end up necessarily negative, but we do need to think about what are the implications of not providing an equal and dignified experience for all team members. So that's a question that I would like each uh, panel member to respond to. And that's aspirational because again, we want to have that vision and we want to talk about, we can't stay here. When Dr. Sukyon says 64%, that's not good enough. I agree with her, that's not good enough. So we don't want to stay there. So what does it look like? Um, and what are the implications of us not providing that equal, not just that welcome experience, but that sense of belonging, that equal experience for all of our team members. And so I'm going to go ahead and um, who would like to uh, respond to that first? Huh. Thank you. Uh, Angela, if you can respond. Um, yeah, it, uh, minority stress, fatigue. Um, uh, sometimes it feels like a, a little bit of poison. Um, uh, and it uh, has a huge impact on retention of um, faculty, staff, and students. I can add on that. Um, I had a privilege of analyzing the employee engagement survey for the last four years. And then it clearly shows that when you don't feel belong, which is through appreciation and recognition, and then um, through transparent communications, then people feel like um, they don't uh, they don't feel appreciated and leading to disengagement. And then, of course, it leads into uh, lower retention rate and then lower performance and then lower morale that you cannot really easily put price tag on. We all lose. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> uh, lower engagement, less productivity, um, less belonging. So it, it doesn't help that individual, but it also significantly and meaningfully impacts the organization that they're part of. So that recognition, appreciation, um, it's very important. Mm -hmm. Um, I can go next. Um, there was another uh, very striking, you know, finding on the survey, like Hispanic and Latino faculty members are seven times more likely uh, to have experienced racism. Um, and that, you know, I, I talk with, you know, the few in the group of Hispanics that I know. Um, we, you know, I have not experienced that, but I wanted to send a message here of what, you know, I have been hearing from colleagues. 
Um, sometimes, you know, because we blend in, there might there can be microaggressions um, and that happen or comments that happen, but people, you know, colleagues forget that <laughs> we are part of a minority. And, you know, I guess this has been happening often. And also the, the lack of, you know, kind of like, that kind of more an, a value added mentality that to uh, welcome the diverse opinions from a Hispanic member and colleague is important that uh, their voices are being heard and valued because also because of their ethnicity. Uh, and I guess, you know, this has been uh, an issue, you know, for some uh, Hispanic faculty. Thank you for. Uh, pointed that out. And even when you talked about microaggressions, uh, when Candace said the power is small, microaggressions are also small daily insults, right, that undermine people. And we know from the research just how people stay, you know, she talk about the power of small people also leave. It's not this one catalytic event that have people lead the organization. They call it death by a thousand cuts. So it's those small daily insults that people get to the point where they say, I can't take it anymore and then they don't uh, retain or, or persist um, at, that, at that place of employment, whether it be SIU or even an external organization. So again, um, like you said, listening, but I also want to say inviting people in when we talk about intentionality and then also paying attention to who's not in the room and making it and in, in, in being very intentional about bringing the Hispanic voice in the room, the value and the hurt, not just listening when they're there, but if they're not there, bringing them into the space so that they uh, voices can be uh, heard and, and valued and respected. So thank you for sharing that, Heidi. If if I could add, um, you, you, Dr. Caldwell, you mentioned something about um, being intentional. I would I would say that the system um, taking it an even larger step is being more intentional about what kind of community organizations and what kind of businesses we are working with in these outside collaborations making sure that these outside entities jive with our mission on anti-racism, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and then make, and, and making sure that those um, coincide. And then another, another step um, uh, with that is um, also just being mindful of the climate that is taking place outside of our campuses. I think, um, I th I think we're pretty fortunate that within our campus, we kind of live in a little bubble of, um, of all of these great things. That's not always the case and in, in, uh, um, where the, uh, the, the experiences within the bubble aren't, um, aren't uh, um, indicative of, of what's happening outside. Um, so really paying attention to different um, legislation that is, that, that is being passed, I'm thinking, primarily about what's happening across the river in Missouri um, about a new um, uh, don't say gay bill and then what other um, neighboring states are doing and are, are doing in in terms of their um, legislation because we're recruiting our students from these neighboring states we're recruiting our uh, faculty and staff from these neighboring states and how are we how is the system prepared to address what's going on outside of Illinois and offering and offering a welcoming and safe space for those that we're inviting into our campus. Yeah, excellent point, uh, Nick, because like you said, the national landscape, um, whether it be our neighbors in St. Louis or Texas or Florida, you know, it definitely um, has had that has an impact and we are recruiting students from across uh, the United States and internationally. So uh, excellent point. Um, and it's, it's grievous, honestly, just to see uh, what's going on in a lot of these states. It's grievous, but uh, as educators, we can, you know, I'm sorry, resist as well as, you know, really tell the truth about and, and give the full story, the unvarnished tale, right? So I, I agree with that. We need to keep resisting and um, fighting back. And I know that is the, the theme of Black History Month <laughs> uh, for our national is, is resistance. And so we have to keep resi resisting those false and incomplete narratives. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and now we're actually going to, um, to transition um, to uh, questions that we have. Uh, we have a question and I might turn this over to uh, Dr. Mahoney and I might have some comments too. The first question is that, is there a certain number uh, that we would say is good enough uh, as far as the percentage rate for acceptance of SIUE? Uh, and I, I just wanna be clear, I'm thinking they're talking about the survey. Is that what they're speaking to as far as, uh, yeah. 
Um, Because I know we talked about the 64% not being good enough. And so, uh, Dr. Mahoney, would you like to share about that? Yeah, it's it's always hard to say exactly what. I mean, obviously, you're always shooting to get as close to 100% as you can. um, And and realizing that's probably not realistic for any group at any time and place and time. Um, I I think what you often try to do and what we, we did certainly with this survey is look at where you are relative to other institutions. And so, I often think about it again from a numbers perspective. Are we a standard deviation or two above everybody else, then we're getting to a point where that's we're setting a kind of mark that's way out there. That would certainly be what our aspiration would be, would be to be way ahead of what any average is, um, not to be at an average or you know slightly above it. It would be to be well above that. Um, so it's not exactly a number, but I think it's more about getting about as high as is reasonable for an institution to get. Understanding, again, you're shooting for 100, but never quite get there. Yeah. I would agree with that. We do look at, and this, and this particular study was benchmarked with other uh, institutions as well. So we do have our highs uh, and our lows, but sometimes with, with weighted average, um, anything really below a 4.0 <laughs> uh, is, is what is really uh, a significant room for improvement, which is about, if we wanted to do a percentage, would be about 80%. And so a lot of our numbers really didn't achieve that. That was the highest uh, welcoming. And that was specifically for, um, uh, the, uh, the white um, members and as well as administrators had the highest numbers, but uh, Hispanic, uh, Asian, African American numbers were lower than that. So again, a, a lot of room for improvement for all of the other uh, groups, um, as well as international um, veterans as well. So um, another question we have is, um, what if it's hard for someone to accept someone who is a part of the LGBTQ? plus community, if it's because of religious beliefs, how would someone combat that and become more accepting? Uh, Maybe maybe Nick wants to (laughs) help me with this one too. Um, So the the question of religious beliefs, I would suggest looking at uh, personal or religious values. And I'm gonna assume that there are some values related to love and related to connecting to others and related to compassion. And um, is your particular religion or is a person's particular religion that that person that's struggling perhaps with um, LGBTQ folks? Um, is your religion about condemning or is it about connection and love? And if it is about connection and love, I'm assuming it, it is, um, uh, you know, taking on the that challenge of how in my own heart can I embrace connection and love if if people are doing something perhaps that I don't understand um, or I don't agree with. Um, and, and I think that's a, a tough thing to wrestle with, but I think it's worth it. And also taking a look at why in this moment in time um, is a particular um, spiritual practice, embracing, um, you know, a a disapproval of LGBTQIA folks, because um, I'm not familiar with every single religious text out there, um, but of those that I am familiar with, it seems like in different periods of time, different parts of different texts become more important or less important. And why now is it is it important to disapprove? Is it important to condemn? And, and maybe look at that. And, um, and I, w- I would suggest looking within your own heart as well and, uh, and having the courage to, to love some, you know, somebody maybe you don't agree with or don't understand. But Nick, do you have something to add to that? I think this is kind of a tough one. Yeah, uh, same. Um, I, I, I think you said it beautifully. I mean, ultimately your relationship with, with uh, religion is completely up to you. Um, historically, um, there have been many Orthodox religions that have not treated LGBTQIA plus people fairly. Um, however, there are several, um, within every major religious, de- um, denomination, there are, um, supportive groups that have adopted, um, different interpretations about LGBTQIA plus people. So, um, I, I, I encourage you to um, do what um, Angela said and really, uh, and, and really think about, you know, is is your religion practicing the art of condemning or the art of loving? Um, and um, it's it's a very complicated and very um, 
intrinsic uh, uh, process, but um, it, it, but yeah, um, really um, evaluating where your personal values and your religious values are um, coinciding. Yeah. If I it could... also costs you nothing to be kind, <laughs> to just be kind to people, that right? <laughs> um, to just be a good human being. Right. And then also yeah. having some sort of connection, meaningful connection really helps to change the other person's perception or limited cultural viewpoint. Um, one of the biggest learning points that I got out of this uh, intercultural development training is that um, you can grow into like understanding from like a similar point, like what we have in common. But then if you want to grow from there and then become really culturally competent, you really need to understand and try to even appreciate why um, this culture is very different. And then, you know, not necessarily agreeing with it, but try to understand why they think that way. It could be um, they never really had LGBTQ community, or it was shaped by some of the media or their religious leaders um, that they were surrounded by. So, um, like understanding those things will help you to grow even further um, because it's really up to the other person how they decide to condemn or love you. But I think um, you try to have that um, posture of curiosity rather than like feeling defensive. I think it, it'll help you to grow. And if I could uh, just add as somebody who, um, I, I do appreciate uh, the person who asked the question, uh, but I, I just think even when we talk about religious texts, I mean, the scriptures teaches that all people are equal image bearers. And so I think you have to start with that, that people are equal <laughs> image bearers in the eyes of God. I think it's also important to note that regardless of, of, of what you believe, uh, that people, everybody deserves respect. Everybody deserves to be treated well, to be loved well. I mean, that is actually a command that we are commanded to love people and not to uh, to, to judge in, in that particular uh, fashion. And that uh, people should not, no one should be deprived of their rights um, based on how people view things. And so that's my uh, conviction. In fact, um, I left a, a religious institution because because I did not believe that people should be treated differently based on uh, perception of that. And I think. As somebody who identifies as a Christian, I would I would do that again because I think that if we can't love and treat people well and dignify people and honor people and respect people, I don't think our religion is worth much. <laughs> and so I just wanted to, to say that as well. That's that's my uh, conviction. And I, I would not work at a place or be at a place. And that's one of the reasons why I'm at SIU and honestly not at uh, some of the religious schools is because I don't believe in making that distinction. In fact, I believe it's against the faith to treat people less than um, based on their identity. I think that's actually against the teaching of the scriptures. So I just wanted to share that. I was going to add just real quickly. I think, you know, for me, again, also a Christian, but, um, you know, what Dr. Town said earlier, really powerful about the data relative using pronouns. Um, and if, if by saying someone's preferred pronouns um, keeps them from committing suicide, keeps them from suicidal thoughts, I don't see how that's inconsistent with my Christian beliefs at all. In fact, I think it's very much aligned. And so for me, I think some of the things that we ask people to do are very simple, as well as I think if I look at my reliefs broadly, seem completely consistent to me. Um, but again, I know others view it differently, but that to me seems a very simple thing that um, if I really care about other human beings and human life, that I should be able to do that. Um. Thank you for, uh, for that for that question and for those insights. I actually, I think we have, I do wanna just share um, uh, some comments. Uh, I see um, someone affirming uh, Dr. Town points about cues, including our syllabi, it's really important. And I just wanted to uh, emphasize that, that again, that the syllabi should be inclusive um, of LGBTQRA, of African-American, Hispanic, Asian, uh, people should be represented. We talked about the word representation a lot and being represented um, in the classroom is, is very important in the curriculum. Uh, so that was something. Um, another comment um, that we need to correct and interrupt people who misgender, um, especially administrators. And I think we just heard powerful data again, affirmed by Dr. Mahoney and first cited by Dr. Town. Um, and, and affirmed again also by Nick as far as why it's so important that we 
uh, use uh, correct pronouns and that we see people and if they change it, that we are fluid and that we're willing to uh, adjust again so we can um, value and respect and dignify people's experiences and their identity as well. Um, and then another question um, that has come, can we revisit how we are recruiting faculty, staff of color? Um, that's also very uh uh, relevant to this to this conversation as well as we talked about retaining and looking specifically um, at um, African American students, African American, Hispanic, uh, just uh, individuals wanting to not persist at the campus because they don't feel welcome and belong, uh, a sense of welcome and belonging. So, who would like to um, address that? I have some comments as well. So I can address that since my research is around there. So there's a lot of research out there that talks about um, how institutions will recruit faculty of color, um, sort of roll out the red carpet and sell them a dream, so to speak. Um, but recruiting um, means nothing if you don't have a plan to retain those faculty, right? And so um, some of the research that I've cited in my dissertation talks about how um, recruits are sold a particular experience and then they're recruited into environments that are not um, conducive to them to be supported or um, in, they're not recruited to a campus climate that is ready to receive them, right? So um, on my, I'll give an example of my previous institution. I was talking to a student, right? This is relevant to faculty as well, but I was talking to a black student ask them, what, what is it like to be Black at this institution? It's like, well, you know, it's interesting. During my visit, I saw all Black students. You know, I saw a lot of Black students on campus. I saw Black faculty. I saw Black staff. And I was excited because I felt seen on this campus. It was part of my decision to come here. And when I got here, I didn't see those people anymore. And then I learned that during my visit, it was the McNair Scholars Weekend. And that's why there were so many Black students there and so many Black people present, right? And so they were sold this particular idea of like, this is what the campus is going to be like. But when they got there, it was something different. And I think the same thing happens sometimes during the faculty recruitment process, right? Um, try to entice us to come here, right? And then once you get there, there's this bait and switch. And so I think being um, honest about what you are recruiting a person into. So one other example from my dissertation, a faculty member went to... Um, a predominantly white institution in a very rural area, very white town. And her spouse was like, wait, we're going where and why? That doesn't scream people of color to me. But she said to me, the reason I chose that place is because they were the only institution that was honest about how white they were and what their issues were with diversity. They told me, we don't have it figured out. It's challenging, it's rough, but here's where we want to go. And so being honest about where we are and what our aspirations are, and then showing people the work that we are doing to get there, um, I think is important. Listening, right? So listening to Heidi's experience, now we understand what she's been experiencing, what her colleagues gathered across campus are experiencing. Now, what are we going to do with that information? Right, like we can initiate a cluster hire. What does that look like? to do that for Hispanic faculty? What are their particular needs? So we talked about like equal treatment, but I'm gonna push us to think about equitable treatment, right? Because what I need may not be what the Hispanic faculty need or Asian faculty need, right? Um, the needs may be different. So how do we get to a place where everybody has what they need? Not necessarily the same thing. Those are some things that I think about when, we, when we're thinking about faculty recruitment, um, listening to applicants, being honest about where we are, and then being intentional about creating space where they can thrive when they get here. I affirm all of that. Yeah, so thank you for uh, sharing those excellent uh, insights. And again, like you said, your, your research is on that. So I think we could probably, we already have a resource that so we can dive into that. Um, as far as what, what are we doing to recruit, um, I also just want to, uh, again, uh, commend uh, Dr. Mahoney. And the reason why I'm actually doing that is because he is the only president uh, in the nation that, that um, and they actually highlighted this when we went to the Southern Regional Education Board, who attends a, a conference that is specifically focused on recruiting um, faculty of color. 
And so I went along with Dr. Mahoney, Dr. James Minor, and we had uh, about seven of us represented. I think we were one of the largest posses uh, that, that they had at that conference. And that's something that we're going to do every year. Uh, we collected uh, VITAs. We actually had an opportunity to actually give feedback to faculty of color about how to strengthen uh, their resumes. And we're keeping in contact and cultivating those relationships to bring them to SIU, again, if they uh, fit into our curriculum, and, and again, if, if this is a place that they want to be. But we are establishing uh, those relationships. I know he's had those relationships. But again, uh, that was in Atlanta, and they rotated. And it's something that we are going to uh, be a part of. And Dr. Mahoney, if you want to share more about that and other initiatives as well. Yeah, no, and I think it's important that uh, our attendance at that conference, again, there's about 1,000 doctoral students of color at the conference. So it's a great opportunity to recruit, but it also, I think having a large group there, having the leadership there sends a message, not only to the people there, but to everybody else that this is something we prioritize. And so I think, uh, I think it was um, Angela talked about it earlier, just the idea of you know, all the little symbols, little things that people look for. Maybe it was, I think it was Angela, you talked about that. I think they talked about that a little bit too. All the little things that you do that send a message to people that, we value this, this is important to us as a university, can make a real difference and helps with that, creating that sense of belonging really from the very beginning. Yeah, and I'll just echo, I've heard from several colleagues who attended that conference to recruit for their programs, like, y'all not playing fair, how do y'all have your president and chancellors and vice chancellors there at the table? Um, it really speaks volumes about the commitment. Thank you for that. So we appreciate uh, that question. And again, I do want to just emphasize what Dr. Hall said. When we recruit, we have to have retention in mind. Um, and so that, that's our goal. We want to make sure that we'll be honest and that we want more people to have the experience that Dr. Uh, Hall has had. And that means that we're being intentional and deliberate in our communication um, as well as far as how we want to enhance our environment and retain. Um, I have a, a few more comments. and. Um, uh, being culturally competent and kind can help us uh, be accepting, understanding, and loving. I think that was in response to the question about Christianity. Uh, I want to actually say this name, Father Brown. Is your religion about loving and accepting, about judging and condemning? I think Dr. Tao said that he said, what a powerful insight, and this has to be the starting point of all faith traditions that are here to be in loving. And I agree with that. That, that needs to be the foundation <laughs> that we ask all those questions from, right? Uh, Ready for change, uh, Ms. Doris Williams. There are many in the LGBT community that have a Christian background and are the most loving people I've ever met. So again, just more affirmation and uh, comments um, with that as well. Uh, we actually are uh, about to close out. I don't see uh, any uh, more questions, uh, but I do want to just provide uh, a few more moments. Are there any other uh, comments that any of our uh, expert panel members would like to say for the for the good of uh, today for the conversation on welcome belong? Any additional insights, um, nuggets that you would like to share before we close out our panel discussion today. I want to thank you, Dr. Chila, Dr. Mahani, and Kand all of you, you know, for inviting uh, you know, me to represent the Hispanics and the Latinx at, at the university. Uh, thank you, Dr. Candace, all for your kind comments every time. Uh, yeah, I, I, I feel heard. And I hope, you know, my colleagues do too. And hopefully from this conversation, something happens. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Dr. Cuervo. Your insight was extremely powerful and helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me and then giving me a chance to talk about um, Asian American community and then just in general belonging. Um, I want to echo what Dr. Hall said earlier about just the power of the small. And so make a connections, uh, ask how are you, and then ready to listen. And um, just to, in small ways, let each other feel that you see them and then you hear them and then uh, they are valued. Thank you. Appreciate that wrap up. Good nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> Good nuggets, yes. All right. Well, again, I just want to, um, I'm going to clap for the panel. <laughs> I know that the audience member, you all can join us for uh, clapping for our uh, panel uh, today. You all were uh, very powerful and helpful and just really gave us um, a really strong foundation uh, to build off of uh, your, your insights, uh, your 
grass on the data. I think we can uh, follow up and really learn from that. And again, it's up to all of us to, to build up the SIU community. I know that's why we're here and that's what we're uh, committed to. So I wanna, again, thank you all. Uh, panel members, as well as uh, attendees uh, and the participants who joined today. And I just want to say thank you. And we will be uh, joining us again in April. And we're going to be actually talking about salary as well as uh, employee appreciation. So we ask that you join us for that. And I just want to say thank you all and enjoy your Valentine's Day. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, I'm going to leave him with the last word. Yes. Yeah. So just real, real quickly, I want to summarize some of the things I think we heard today. And I, as I was reflecting on it, I think we got a lot of what I was hoping to get out of this conversation. You know, some are things that certainly at my level we can think about doing better. I know um, Dr. Cuervo talked about you know lack of representation in leadership roles, and and Father Brown actually in the comments also mentioned you know even if it's not in um, a certain leadership role or a certain vice chancellor position, are there things we can do to make sure that at the table we have diverse voices as we're making major decisions? And that's certainly something I think that falls on us a lot. There's also a lot of things that I think go across both us as leaders and really everybody at the institution. We talked a lot about policies and looking at those. Some of those we do at my level, but some of those are really under the control of faculty and staff at, at other levels. And so I think it's a responsibility for all of us to look at our policies and make sure that they are uh, making everybody feel welcome and, and, and kind of doing those things that it doesn't um, seem to bias against certain groups. So I think that that's something we can all do. Uh, but I also was really left, oh, actually, yeah, the other thing too, I think was important, came up a couple of times, I think is having a thriving group in a space um, really seems to be critically important to people. I'm not surprised to hear that, but I know certainly um, having that, I think helps a lot of people out. And so I think we need to, again, look at where we don't have that and where we can create those spaces and, and groups uh, going forward. But I also, I'm kind of left mostly with the, um, we can all do something. So the, the power of small concept that came up, I think, over and over again, whether it's using preferred pronouns, whether it's reaching out to someone to see how they're doing, whether it's understanding that there may be cultural differences um, and that we need to be open to that and understand how I might accommodate or change a little bit what I do. I always think about when I was a, a doctoral advisor and most of my students were from Korea, I had to learn that there were some cultural differences and I had to change a little bit my approach. It was a small change. It wasn't major, but it helped them feel like they belonged and helped them to thrive. And that was really what it's all about. Um, and, and it always reminds me that uh, in a lot of this work, we often talk about this is really the right thing to do. Um, but really, it's a smart thing to do. Our goal is to recruit, retain the best faculty, staff and students we can. And we really can't do that unless we make some of these changes. And again, all of us can play a part in doing that. So again, thank you to the panel for your insight. Um, Thank you for everybody who's joined us uh, on YouTube and listened to this conversation.